Thank you for the opportunity to come into the house of the Lord as one people, singing with one voice, with one heart, one spirit. God, we desire an encounter with you. That's all we want. That's all we really need is a touch from you. And so, God, we position our hearts and our minds and our thoughts to receive from you this morning. We declare, God, that you are worthy of all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. And so we open ourselves to you. Lord, I pray that your word would come forth with clarity, that it would bring understanding, that it would set us free in the areas where we're bound, that it would open our eyes in the areas where we're blinded, that we would understand the mysteries of the faith. So, God, we come not with enticing words of men's wisdom, but a demonstration of spirit and power, that our faith not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. God, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Before you take your seats, make sure you hug about two or three people and tell them I'm glad to see you this morning. Can you put my... Put my declaration up there. As a matter of fact, don't sit down. <laughs> don't don't sit down just yet. Don't sit down just yet. Don't sit down just yet. Real quickly. Let's make our declaration to the Lord this morning. Some of y'all know it by heart, so we can just run right into it. Amen. Yep, 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 yep. We ready? We ready? Amen. I love it when people get just caught up in loving on each other. It's a good thing. Amen. If you all can see it, if you know it by heart, let's just go right into it. Y'all ready? One, two, three. I'm born again. Take your seats. Take your seats. On today, uh, May 20th, 2018, this is the day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost is a day that is forgotten by most believers. And in all actuality, it is the second most important day in the life of the church. You say, well, what's the first? Resurrection. Amen. What about the birth of Jesus? Well, if the Bible thought that that was very important, it would, it would have designated exactly what that day is. Mm -hmm. Society has snatched that day and commercialized it and used yes. it for its own gain. Yes. But one of the days that society has not touched, because it cannot touch this, because it's not marketable, is the day of Pentecost. Amen. The day of Pentecost is the real date where the church was born. Mm. As I was doing my study, I began to see how the day of Pentecost and the day of Jesus' birth are very similar. They are both birthed by the Spirit. Mm. Yeah. The church was not a man-made thing, as most people have said. The church was actually born of the Holy Spirit. That without the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, there would be no church. Mm -hmm. But because of the Holy Spirit birthing this new thing that spread across the hemisphere and transformed the world, 
as we know it today, we understand that the church is a supernatural thing. The day of Pentecost is one of those days that people shy away from because of the Pentecostal denomination. But the day of Pentecost is not about a denomination. Amen. It's about an event that transformed the landscape of the world. Everything changed the day that the Holy Spirit arrived on planet Earth. Amen. When the Holy Spirit was poured out, everything shifted, everything changed, everything transformed. If there was no Pentecost, there was no power. The church was powerless without the day of Pentecost. As a matter of fact, the Bible says in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 that you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judah and Samaria, even to the ends of the earth. That the power that it took to witness could not have happened without the day of Pentecost. If there was no Pentecost, there was no spiritual gifts. Because without the Holy Spirit being poured out, there would be no prophecy. There would be no word of wisdom, word of knowledge, word of faith, <clears throat> speaking in tongues, interpretation of tongues, discerning of spirits. If there's no Pentecost, there's no progress. The church would have stayed stagnant and it would have stayed this small, insignificant group of rebels that were just troubling the Roman government. But because of the day of Pentecost, the Bible says that the word of God spread throughout the region. If there's no Pentecost, there would have been no proof of salvation. Most people would not have been able to tell the difference between a Christian and a Jew, except for the fact that when the Holy Spirit came upon them, they began to prophesy and speak with other tongues. It's interesting to me that when Peter went to the council, he had to make a case for the Gentiles based upon them receiving the same gift that they received. Mm -hmm. In Acts chapter 11, verse 17 and 18. If there was no Pentecost, there'd be no security in our salvation. Mm -hmm. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14, that once you believed, you were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit. And it was the guarantee on the purchase price. Anybody ever bought a house? That's right. Don't you gotta you gotta drop down a guarantee? You gotta drop down a payment that says, I am agreeing to this covenant that I'm gonna buy this house. And so they asked for that. And so the Holy Spirit is our down payment. It is the guarantee that when he comes back, he's coming for you and me. And so the Holy Spirit was promised from the Old Testament in Joel chapter 2, verses 28 through 32. And Jesus promised that the Holy Spirit would come. And he promised that the Holy Spirit would baptize us or fill us and indwell us. He promised that the Holy Spirit would give us the power to proclaim, it would inspire, and it would cause us to demonstrate the presence of God. He also sent the Holy Spirit to bring change to a world that was in desperate need of change. As we pick up in our text today in Acts chapter 2, I'm going to slowly walk through this and break down what it is that we have forgotten about the day of Pentecost. In Acts chapter 2, it says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat on each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The first thing that jumps out to me is the timing. Turn around tell your neighbor, timing is everything. The Holy Spirit 
came on the seventh Saturday plus one day, <laughs> which makes 50. It was promised from the Old Testament, seven Sabbaths plus one. And it's interesting that that particular number means that the Holy Spirit came exactly 10 days after Jesus ascended. Which also falls on the largest gathering of people out of all the feast days. There is no other day that people gathered as much as the day of Pentecost. They actually came from everywhere. And as the Bible says, that there were people from every place. Verse 5, and there dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. Timing is always the key to understanding what God is doing. If you don't understand the timing, then you won't understand what is going on. He says when the day of Pentecost had fully come. Which, if you begin to study the Jewish calendar, their days are arranged differently from ours. And when he says it had fully come, it meant that the Sabbath was over and a new day had begun. That until that new day, which was Sunday, the first day of the week had come, Pentecost hadn't fully come, even though that week they were celebrating it. But this was the day that was designated by God to birth something new in the earth. Turn around and tell your neighbor that God has got a day for you. That he's going to birth something new in your life. And you can sit around and think that it's not coming, but there's always a time coming for shift and change. And most people miss it because they're not paying any attention to the fact that if God said it, that settles it and it's going to happen. And some of us are holding on to old things, holding on to the past, holding on to the way things were. But when the Holy Spirit was poured out, everything changed. The traditional Jewish religion that they were following had just been blown up and something new emerged on the scene. And it was full of power, it was full of glory, it was full of majesty. There was so much more to what the, the, the Christians had received on that day than what they had ever seen before. Yes. Turn around and tell somebody something new. Something new. And so we see the timing. As a matter of fact, the timing was perfect. The timing was perfect because at no other time could this have happened. As a matter of fact, I was explaining this to my wife, is that when Jesus ascended into heaven, it was almost exactly the same way that when Elisha was watching Elijah ascend into heaven. And the same promise was given, that if you watch me go up, yeah. you're going to receive what I have. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Timing is everything. And to receive your promise, you've got to understand that that promise is based upon a timetable. And so he told them from that moment, now go tarry until you be endowed with power from on high. But they had to be there to understand it. The Bible says that for 40 days, Jesus ate and taught. He ascended and 10 days later, 10 days later, the Holy Spirit was poured out. The second thing that jumps out at me is not just the timing, but the togetherness. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know what most Christians lack? <laughs> Need I have to say it? Christians have, are supposed to be the most unified people, but they are the most separate people. As a matter of fact, Christians treat church like work. When I leave church, I don't even talk to you no more. I'll see you next week. You punch out, put your lunch pail up, and walk on out the door. Right? And it's interesting to me that people are like that when they read a Bible that calls for them to be unified. 
Now, I'm going to illustrate this, so you're going to have to follow me because it's going to be a lot of scripture. So we see right here in Acts chapter 2, verse 2, and suddenly, or verse 1, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they all were with one accord in one place. You flip over to Acts chapter 2 and verse 41. Those who, glad, actually verse 44. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common. Mm -hmm. Acts chapter 4, verse 32. Now the multitude of those who believed were with one heart yep. and one soul. Yeah. Maybe that's just something that happened in the book of Acts. Let's check the book of Romans and see if the next book over has anything like that. <laughs> in Romans chapter 12 and verse 4. It says, for as we have many members in one body, but all members do not have the same function. So we, being many, are one body yeah. in Christ and individual members of one another. Yeah. Let's check Corinthians and see if Corinthians says anything about it. Uh -huh. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 12. Yeah. For, as the, for as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, so is Christ. Yes, yes, yes. And I could go on, for we, uh, by one spirit, yes. we were all baptized into one body, uh -huh. whether Jews or Greeks or whether slaves or free, we all have been made to drink into one spirit. Right. Now maybe that's just something that's in Corinthians and Romans. Let's check Galatians. Uh -huh. Let's see if Galatians has anything to say about our oneness in Christ. As a matter of fact, Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 through 28, for you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. oh, maybe that's just a few books. Let's check Colossians. Come on, let's check it. Let's check Actually, it. let's not go to Colossians. Let's go Philippians first since that's in order. Okay. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 1. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ and any comfort of love and any fellowship in the spirit, any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same yes. love, being of one accord and of one mind. Yes. Yes. Colossians chapter 3. Yes, sir. Verse 11. Where there's neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian nor Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. And we can go on and on. That the entire theme of the New Testament is oneness. Amen. That might be why we don't see the power of God. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Wow. He said that they were all in one place on one accord. That's the hardest thing to do. Yeah. Not only to get people in one place, but then to get them in one accord Amen. while they're in that one place. Wow. During the average gathering, you have half the people thinking about dinner. The other half is thinking about going back to sleep. There's another percentage that's thinking about going fishing. Taking a trip in the mountains. Anything but worshiping God in spirit and in truth. What if we came together with one accord in one place and worship God yeah. together. Wow. Yes. Imagine the difference that there would be in the times that we shared together. Mm -hmm. Imagine if every time we came together, it was for the purpose, for that one particular purpose, and that is to honor and worship God. Imagine how he would visit us. Yes. Well, all we got to do is look at the day of Pentecost. Yes. yes, this was a very special event, but it teaches us something about how God works. Uh -huh. God likes to work in unity. Yes. In oneness. Yes. It's interesting to me that 
we have such an issue with oneness that if we are too much together, we get tired of each other. I don't want to see y'all every day. I don't want to see y'all every other day. Once a week. But what if we came together? Imagine the revelation, the inspiration. Imagine the things that we could do. Musicians, when they hang out together, songs come out of nowhere. When, when, when writers sit together, poetry and words come out of nowhere. When people sit together sharing verses of scripture with one another, revelation just seems to appear. But all of a sudden, now we got to run back to our corners. And we miss out on what God was trying to do. And so we have the timing, we have the togetherness. But then there's a sound. He says in verse 2, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. I asked my wife, I said, what, what is the sound of a rushing mighty wind? And then I looked it up and it said that it blows, it howls, it ruffles, it gusts, it whistles, it shakes, and it moves. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That when that sound came, I don't know exactly what it was like, but I can imagine the feeling in the room that something was coming. Yeah. And it wasn't just the regular prayer meeting on this particular day. Something big was happening. And as the sound began to grow, it began to fill the entire house where they were sitting. Yeah. Something was about to explode. And what's interesting is that in Acts chapter 4, as they prayed, the same thing happened, that they were filled again, and the Bible says that the room shook. And so yeah. when the Holy Spirit yeah. shows up, it yeah. seems like things shake, and things move, and things are rearranged. And, and if it stays the same, then that wasn't the Holy Spirit, right. because the Holy Spirit is going to move things yeah. in our life. Yeah. 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 Now, 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 let's take the house that they were sitting in, and see yourself as a house. Yes. And when the Holy Spirit comes, he begins to move things yes. in your house. Yes. He begins to shake things. He, he begins to rearrange things. He begins to turn things over. There are things that would have stayed put except the Holy Spirit came with a mighty rushing wind. Somebody ought to just say, Lord, blow. Lord, blow. And see, people don't understand that when you really get in the presence of God, you cannot stay the same. This particular event seems to be just a singular event, but this is the kind of event that should be happening in our gatherings all the time. That when we come out, we ought to know that we have been with the Lord. And if you don't believe me, I'll just prove it just by reading uh, chapter, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And look what he says. In verse uh, 24, but if all prophesy and an unbeliever, an uninformed person comes in, he is convinced by all and convicted by all. Thus, the secrets of his heart are revealed. And so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report truly the Lord was in this place. There are too often that we walk out and we don't have that mindset that truly the Lord was in this place. And part of that is because we defeat ourselves because we're so divided in our worship. Mm. But as we come together, then the Holy Spirit can come through. Amen. Say that with me. As we come together, we come together then, the then the Holy Spirit will come through. The invitation for the Holy Spirit to show up is your unity. Amen. Amen. Oh, didn't, I thought y'all shout off that. <laughs> The invitation for God to come on in is when people come together. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Amen. And so there's a sound. And this sound filled the entire house. But not only was there a sound, there were some sights. There were some things that they got to look at. Verse 3. There appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. 
I said, Lord, why divide it? And I looked at different translations, and it said different, or diverse, or a variety. It was almost like God took his language, and he just divided it up within the room. It's like taking, uh, uh, how, how many roll dice, and you take your dice and you just roll them. But imagine as you roll them, they multiply mm -hmm. to fit the number of people that are in the room. And so God just releases the tongues, divides them up amongst the people, but these are tongues as a fire. The fire signifies the spontaneous combustion that happens when uh, a spark meets a very dry thing. Sometimes we've got to get to the place where we are so thirsty that we are so dry that we have poured out so much that God can come in and just a little spark will wreck everybody and wreck everything. But some of us are so full and so comfortable. We haven't poured out anything. We haven't battled anything during the week. We haven't been persecuted enough. We haven't been tried enough. We haven't been tested enough. We haven't gone to a place where we're desperate enough to need a, 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 a combustible moment by the Holy Spirit. And see, a lot of times we're so relaxed because there's nothing that we really need. That's right. But when something dry gets a spark, the fire spreads. And it is a spontaneous Spread just like in a forest. And it can take down the entire forest. You let the Holy Spirit come through in anything. In his path. The Bible says our God is a what? Consuming. Oh, Y'all don't know God like that. Y'all never had the fire of the Holy Spirit really get on you. Where you just couldn't stop. You just had to praise God. You just had to lift him up. You just had to magnify him. You just had to tell somebody about him. You couldn't contain it any longer. Jeremiah said it's like fire. Shut up in my bones and just won't leave me alone. Yes. Oh, God. Yes. See, you've got to get to the place where you understand yes. that God is looking for a thirsty. Yes. Yes. My God. We sang the song, Almighty God, we need you right now. Right. But do you really need him? Yes. Do you really want to connect with him? Yes. Do you really want to not be the same as you were when you came in? Is there really a part of you that's so desperate for God that you don't care about the person next? upside the head when you lift your hands because you're not thinking about them. You might knock over their chair, but you're going to worship God in spirit, and in truth, they're going to know that it was sincere. Uh, my bad, I just got to give him some glory right now. When our thirst for God is at its peak, and we are on one accord, the spirit can combust within the confines of the church. The day of Pentecost was the site of a supernatural phenomenon. Two types of disastrous things came together at once. A tornado and a volcano. Could you imagine a tornado happening at the same time that a volcano was erupting? Imagine how far the flames could be thrown. Imagine how far the fires could reach. If as the volcano erupted, the tornado took and just threw the lava and the flame everywhere. And, 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 and imagine them working together. That's what you got here because the Bible says yeah. that people from all walks of life were hit by this. Yeah. People heard the sound and they experienced what was going on and this shifted the entire landscape. Yeah. That all of a sudden from this moment, the gospel spread. Yeah. As a matter of fact, by the end of the chapter 3,000 souls had already been won. Right. Just by the end of the chapter, that's how fast this thing was moving. I could never imagine such a thing. But you've got to get the right kind of people yeah. with the right kind of attitude yes. all together. Yes. Yes. And all of a sudden, you get the right kind of event yes. that produces change. Hallelujah. We have 
the timing, we have the togetherness, we have the sounds and the sights. But then there's the utterance. He says in verse 4, And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now from further research, this utterance, according to the people who were listening, just taking a cursory look at verse 11, the Cretans, the Arabs, we all hear them speak in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. This means that they were praising him. Yes. First and foremost, they were praising him or giving him thanks. Amen. Number two, they were proclaiming him. That's right. That means they were giving him glory in the yeah. midst of all these people. But not only were they praising him and proclaiming him, they were prophesying. Yeah. They were giving testimony of what God was doing. Yeah. They were yeah. speaking on his behalf. Oh, yeah. It's interesting that we will confine or reduce uh, the move of the Holy Spirit to just the gift of tongues. Mm -hmm. But these three things, to me, are the critical sign that something has happened in your life. That there is a praise on the inside, according to the writer, that I can't keep to myself. He said there's a holler raising up from the depths of my soul. He, he said that there's a praise. You know that the Holy Spirit is not moving if there's no praise. You know that the Holy Spirit is not moving if there's no proclamation of his glory and his greatness. See, when the Holy Spirit starts moving, you can't help but proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to tell the world all about him because you can't help but proclaim it. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's going to be prophetic words. You're going to have something to say on his behalf. Yeah. You're going to be able to tell somebody about what he's saying yeah. and what he's thinking and what his plans are and his purposes are in the earth. The average believer goes weeks. Without a praise, unless they show oh, wow. up at church. Yeah. Mm. Yes. Without a proclamation, wow. unless somebody tells them to say something. That's awful. And without a prophecy. Where are the people who are walking around filled with the Holy Spirit? Yes. The Bible says, do not quench him. Right, right, right. But we have become professionals at quenching the Holy Spirit. Yeah. That's why we're so concerned with somebody stepping on my shoe instead of somebody's soul that needs to be saved. Mm. It's so easy to get offended when you're stopped up and you're not flowing in the gift of the Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit, you can't offend the Holy Spirit. You can't offend. As soon as you start talking, he starts blessing you. Because the Bible says that he will bless them that curse and pray for them. You start messing with him, he'll pray for you. That's how you know you're operating in the Holy Spirit because you'll start praying for folks. You'll start blessing them. They're talking bad about you, you bless them. I wish above all things that they were prospering yeah. in good health, even as their soul prospered. Yeah. While they're talking bad about you. That's right. That's right. Mm. While they're talking about how crooked your wig is and okay. how messed up your makeup is and the old shoes you got on, you still bless them. Y'all yes. yes. don't know how to bless them. Y'all yes. don't know how to bless them. The utterance. Where's the utterance? Why is it that we're so silent? Mm, come on. We're silent on our jobs. We're silent in our schools. We're silent in our neighborhoods. We're silent. We're silent. Well, one of the reasons is because it goes back to the beginning that we don't understand the timing. Right now, the most important thing that you need to know is that we're coming to the end. In theologian terminology, we have to be students of eschatology. What is eschatology? It's the study of the end times. And believe it or not, the end times began the moment the Holy Spirit was poured out. As we did a study earlier this year in the book of Joel, the Joel is an eschatological book. Even though it's in the Old Testament, it is talking about future events that will happen way past the times of the Bible and even past the times that we live in now. And one of the events that it spoke about was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. In verse 17 of Acts chapter 2, it says, And it shall come to pass 
in the last days, mm -hmm. says the Lord, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. And your old men dream dreams. On my maid servants, or on my men servants and my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. What people don't understand is that every single person here, under the sound of my voice, has the gift of prophecy. What do you mean they have the gift of prophecy? Because they have the Holy Spirit. And if you are not speaking forth the message, message of God, it's, for, it's because somehow you're quenching it. And you're focused on something else other than what you have been birthed for. From that moment when they came, imagine a baby coming out of the womb silent. How many people have had a child uh, in, in this room? Come on. How many of you have been in the room when a child was born? Yeah, I've, I've been in there. When that baby comes out, the first thing that they're listening for is the what? Right. The cry. Right. And that tells me that the baby is alive and healthy. On the day of Pentecost, the church came out crying loud. The church came out with a big voice. The church came out with their voice tuned all the way up and they had it on 10 and they began to proclaim. Why is the church now more silent than it was then when we know more now? We're more skilled now. We're more mature now. We have more information now. We don't understand the times now. In the very beginning, the baby came out screaming and hollering and crying and we knew it was alive and then somehow about 2,000 years yeah. later, we yeah. got silent. Yeah. You know why? Because we forgot. Yeah. See, you got to take people back to their roots and show them who they are. And this is you. Yes. This is your roots. This is where you come from. This is the, the, the stock of, that you are birthed from. This is the tree that you are to be plucked from. This is your heritage. I know, yeah, we're from Africa and all that kind of stuff, but according to the spirit, this is your birthright. This is your heritage. This is who you are. And you're not a silent people. You're not a, a, a passive people. You're not a people that lack power. You actually have everything you need to accomplish everything that God has called you to accomplish. And the purpose is still the same, that people have to know that Jesus Christ is Lord. He said you'll receive power to become my witnesses, not to just sit in the church and stare at each other other mad at each other stomping and fighting he wants you to go out and proclaim the praises of him who's called you out of darkness into the marvelous light. there's something about understanding who you are that will help you to do what you're supposed to do and i gotta close once you understand who you are you're more likely to do what you're supposed to do now you know me i'm a coach and so once I get a player in the right position, then I can teach them to be exactly what they're supposed to be and do exactly what they're supposed to do. If I got a quarterback that thinks he's a receiver, he's not going to be very effective. If I got a cornerback that thinks he's a receiver, the reason why they put you on defense, bro, is because you ain't got no hands. <laughs> So you need to be defending, not trying to catch. Yes. Amen. Uh, yeah. But when people understand who they are, it makes it easier, easier yes. to be or do what they're supposed to do. Right. The Lord told me we've forgotten the day of Pentecost because it's not marketable. You can't sell Pentecost t-shirts. There's nobody coming down the chimney on Pentecost. There's no eggs. There's no colors. The day of Pentecost is sacred because you really can't touch it. There's really nothing you can do with it except understand that this is a supernatural thing that only the people of God are privileged to. What if we got back to operating according to the Holy Spirit? What if we got back to living our lives, listening to the Spirit of God and moving on His behalf? What if we didn't have to wait for a program or a campaign to go win souls? What if it was just in us because 
And every morning when we spend time in his presence, he filled us again. Yeah. One of the things that we're missing out on, and this is probably for everyone in this room, you've been too concerned with life that you've forgotten to live. To really live, it comes out of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was what brought Jesus into the world. The Holy Spirit is what birthed the church into the world. And if we are disconnected from our life force, are we really alive? We have made it so spooky spiritual for God to speak to us and move on us. There are times where I be in places and God will say, I want you to say this to this person. But you get around people who just live average and normal and that goes away. You let them reduce you to the common average everyday person. You say, well, that's not my gifting. Do you, if you have the Holy Spirit, you have the ability to affect change anywhere you go because that's what he does. The Holy Spirit is a worker. He's not a sinner. He's not an observer. He's a worker. And you ought to feel yourself daily with the presence of God. Jesus said before he went to the cross that out of your bellies shall flow rivers. Some of us got a drip. Some of us got a little Some of us got a leak. It's kind of leaking out. Where are the rivers? Where are the rivers of living water? Why aren't we walking around full? It's because we forget. We celebrate Christmas. We celebrate Easter. But we never celebrate the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, Francis Chan wrote a book called The Forgotten God. And it's about how people have diminished the effect of the Holy Spirit because we are afraid that we'll look spooky spiritual. But we're just a club if there's no spirit. My atheist friend tells me all the time, religion are like religions is like colors. Just pick one. But what he doesn't understand is that I didn't pick God. That's right. He chose, he chose me. Yes. He came and found me. Yes. He picked me up yes. when I was in the muck and the miry place. Yes. He saw me. I was blind yes. and couldn't see. I was sick and needed a doctor. I was lost and needed to be found. I, I wasn't looking to be found. I was just content with living my life the way I was living it. It was okay the way it was, but it was he that came church and if 
two or three are speaking, somebody should be judging it. We should be doing it decently in order because we can't just all just speak in tongues at the same time because then people will be confused and won't know what's going on. But on that particular day, there was no restraint to it. And the reason why there was no restraint because it was a moment that was setting the stage for what the book of Acts would look like. And when you study through the book of Acts, they were always scattering and winning souls and then scattering and then winning souls and then scattering. Every time we come together, we ought to break out of this place like we're breaking out of a huddle. And everybody should have a prophetic assignment when they walk out the door. Whether your assignment is your household, your job, your school, your neighborhood, but you walk out ready, break, and you go to accomplish your mission and your assignment. Yes. We've got too many Christians that are not on assignment. They come and they go, they come and they go. That's why they're not so hungry to get back into the church because they don't have no assignment. There's nothing to get information for. I got players that after every play, they come back home. Do I go that way? That means that person is doing their job. Yeah. They can't wait to get back in the huddle and say, you know, what, what do we need to do? If they come this way, what do we do? But if I just go out there and just come back to the sideline, you got any questions? No. When's the game over, coach? I'm ready to go. I don't want you on my team.
lift your hands up. Bless you. 